Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Hey, we're looking good. All right. Uh, good to see you here this morning. If you are visiting with us, glad you joined us here. Uh, we want to make sure that you've got some information about us. So when the service is over, if you would make your way to the front of the sound booth, there's a table there. Uh, there's a white bag, some white bags on there. One of those is for you. Please grab one of those and look through it. And uh, as you go through it, you might find information about us in there that you have more questions about. And you, by all means, feel free to give me a call. I'll be glad to try to answer those things. Also, as we do every week, if you got your bulletin, if you grabbed one of those when you came in, on the very back is a communication card. Please, right now, take a moment, fill out the information on the information card, tear it off, and in just a little while when we receive the offering, you can go ahead and place that in the, uh, in the offering basket when it comes by. You can leave it on your chair if you want to do that. Uh, either one, we will find it. So please, take a moment right now to do that. Uh, all kids up through fifth grade, come on up as you get ready to go to your time of kids' worship. So if you're new and you don't know what we're doing, we have a box, and it's supposed to come up here, and it's, they're supposed to put something in it, and I am supposed to teach them something about God from whatever I find in the box. Oh, did you make this? Look at you guys. Didn't she do a great job? Oh, how pretty. Oh, does anybody know what it is? A J. It is a J. Do you know what it's for? To put on the tree. To put on the tree. What kind of tree? Christmas tree. A Christmas tree. What do you think it stands for? What does the J stand for? God. It stands for Jesus, right? Yeah, Jesus. And why would you say God when you think of Jesus? Oh, because Jesus was fully a person, a human like you and like me. 100% completely, totally a person like you and me. But he was also 100% completely and totally God. I know, right? Mind blown. Yeah, I know. We can barely wrap our minds around it. It's such a big idea. But that's because we serve a big God. Isn't that awesome? Do you know the Bible says that his ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He thinks things and does things that we cannot understand, and that's okay. We aren't supposed to understand. So whenever you see anything, a J, maybe you're looking and you see the word joy, Maybe your name starts with a J. Whenever you see a J, whenever you see a Christmas ornament or anything of the like, remember that Jesus was 100% person and he was 100% God. And we don't have to understand it because God's ways are higher than ours and his thoughts are higher than ours. That's beautiful. You did a really nice job. Thank you. Pastor Mike will hand out the box because that's his job. All right, let me pray for you and you'll go to your classes. Lord, I cannot thank you enough that your ways are higher than mine and that your thoughts are higher than mine, that I don't have to figure everything out, that I can trust you that I can rest in you, that even though I don't understand so much, I can rest in the fact that you've got it all figured out. Oh, my Father, please impress upon the hearts of these children your ways. I pray that every single one of them 
would surrender their will to you and, and call on you as their Abba Father, their Master, their Savior. I pray this morning your hand would be on their teachers, that you would help them to teach your word accurately in a clear way that these kids can understand and that they would speak your truth boldly in love. Be in this place this morning. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Man, I don't know. They were pumped for that one today. They were going to make that thing hurt. That was good. We do serve a really great God, don't we? Yeah. Let's talk to him, shall we? Father, you are indeed a great God. We are, so, we are so blessed, truthfully, to be able to be here, to be able to worship you. Lord, we just we stand in awe of you. This morning, Father, we come here with... Um, all sorts of things going on in life. And everybody's got something different. There might be just, we might be in a season where uh, things are just going so well and so smooth. And Father, we just want to give you thanks and give you praise for that. But we also might be in a season where things aren't going so well. Maybe there's a lot of uncertainty. Maybe there's a lot of hurt. And Lord, we need your Holy Spirit's comfort today. So Father, as we come to worship you, Father, we would ask that you administer to us wherever we are, whatever's going on in our life. Lord, help us to be able to, to take the barriers that are, that are blocking us from you right now, Lord, and help remove them so that we can focus on you. We want to give you all of our attention. Lord, we want to hear from you today. We want to have our hearts opened. We want to have our minds opened. We want to have our lives transformed. And we know, Father, that your spirit hovers here and that he can do just that. So, Lord, we're praying for that today. So we give you our, our praise, our worship. We do it in song, Lord. We do it as we open up your word here in just a little while. And we do it by giving to you because that's what you've designed. You want us to give. And so, Lord, we give to you. And as we do, we ask, Father, that you will receive these gifts uh, for the honor in which they were intended. We ask, Lord, that you give us wisdom in how to use these resources. Because, Father, we just want to continue to do what you want us to do. And we want to be able to reach people for Jesus Christ. So help us to do that, Father, we would pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We will receive the offering at this time, and as we do, remember, if you got your communication card all done, go ahead and put it in the basket if you want to. Again, you can leave it on your chair if you want to as well. <clears throat>
back among the living this week. If you were here last week, you uh, were treated to a weird thing. Um, I gave the message via video as if you were attending my memorial service. Probably the weirdest thing was that I checked out, like I left, and that was really weird. I felt like I was playing hooky all day long, but it was to help that effect that if I were to be gone, these were the last words that I wanted to say to you. So that was last week. This week, we're going to do things just a little bit different again. It won't be like that, I promise you. But uh, normally, we like to dig through Scripture and, and pick a section of Scripture apart and just go verse by verse and really pick it apart. We're going to do something just a little bit different today. I'm going to take a section of Scripture. We're going to read through the entire Scripture, and then we're going to use that as the basis for what we're talking about today. So the Scripture we're looking at, let's just dive right in. It's going to be in Hebrews. All right, Hebrews, so you're in the New Testament. I'm uh, moving your way towards the back, actually, in the New Testament. So if you keep turning your pages and you get to the Timothys and the Thessalonians and all those, keep right on going, and you'll get to Hebrews. And we're going to begin with Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6 today. It will be on the screen as well if you don't have your Bibles with you. But I certainly encourage you each and every week, uh, grab a Bible, bring a Bible with you. Uh, we like to mark them up from time to time to help us in our study. So Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command 
that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. And it's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So here's the question right away I want to ask you. Do you believe in God? Are you a Christian? Would you call yourself a Christian? Seems like kind of a weird question to ask a room full of people who are gathered, you know, to worship God, you know, that type of thing. But it's really not that weird. You know, unfortunately, too many people identify themselves and answer the question about being a Christian by answering the belief question. In other words, I'm a Christian because I believe in God. And what they really mean is they believe in the existence of God. But that's not exactly what is being asked here. In fact, it's not even what the author of Hebrews is getting to. He said that a person must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So what does that mean? That's what we're going to be exploring today. What does it mean to believe in God that he exists and to earnestly seek him? We read in James chapter 2, you say that you have faith for you believe that there's one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. How foolish. See, the confusion regarding this issue comes from the fact that there are a lot of groups raising up today that go under the name of Christian. And they're really not. And it confuses things. You know, Jesus' first followers were called followers of the way. Uh, We assume that that's because Jesus referred to himself as, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so those who followed him would be considered followers of the way. But today, we also have other groups with the way in them that lend to the confusion. Like there's a group called the Way International. This group believes Jesus existed, but they don't really believe that Jesus was God. He just was a good teacher. And they also believe that you don't need to go through Jesus to get to heaven. You just need to be a good person. You can do it by your own efforts. And their leader is a guy who believes that he received some special revelation from God as how you're supposed to read Scripture, what Scripture really means. It's kind of cultish, actually. That's the way international. Then you have this group called the Infinite Way, which is all about meditation, and they try to get you to just focus on a word. Okay, just one word and re- repeat it over and over and over again and keep clear in your mind. And if stuff comes coming into your mind and questions and, and different thoughts, well, you got to keep repeating, keep repeating until your mind finally gets clear. And then when it's clear, you finally can be in touch with the Christ in you. Very New Age-ish. And then you've got this group that's out there that's called the Third Way. And the third way really is just what it sounds like. It's like, I don't like this way. I don't like that way. We're going to come up with a third way. And the third way is like they're middle of the ground with everything. They don't really subscribe to anything. If the truth from Scripture is something that's going to be polarizing in society, then they're just going to err on, hey, I'm not going to make a decision here. I'm not going to land on anything. Let's just love one another. Let's not really take anything and hold to it. That's the third way. But you see, all of these have the way in it, and that's why it's confusing. It's confusing even to believers, if you can imagine that. I mean, look, we read in Matthew 24, for false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. I don't know if you knew this before, but the enemy's coming after you. If you claim to be a believer in Christ, he's coming after you. He doesn't just go, oop, lost that one. I guess I'll move on to another one. What he's really doing is going, oh, 
Turn up the heat on that one. I mean, you, you think if he gets joy steering somebody away from Christ, he gets even more joy if he can steer a believer away from Christ, if that's even possible. So he's not quitting. So what does it mean? I mean, obviously, it's something more than, you know, when we say believing in God, it's something more than just believing that he exists. Okay, so when I say to somebody, Gino, I say, Gino, I believe in you, man. I believe in you. What am I really saying to Gino? I'm saying, I believe in you as a person, and I believe in your ability to do as you are willed to do. I believe in that. And it's the same way when we say that we believe in God. We believe in who God is, who he says he is, and we believe in his ability to do what he wills to do. That's what believing in God is all about. It's deeper than just a mere existence. It has to do with hope. And confidence in that person. Hope and confidence in them as a person. Hope and confidence in them in their abilities to carry out that which they will. So let's kind of start defining this here. A true Christian. true Christian is one who believes in God. So what exactly does that mean? What hope and confidence does somebody who say that they believe in God, what do they really have in God? Well, to believe in God, first and foremost, means to have hope and confidence in Him as Creator. As Creator. We believe that God created all things, right? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I don't want to go too far. I don't want to get ahead of you. Who created? Oh, we didn't sound so sure. Who created the heavens and earth? There you go. Just want to make sure we're on the same page. He created everything, including you and me. Right, including you and me, Genesis 1, 27, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. I don't know if you've ever stopped to just break down, I, this is just weird stuff that I do every once in a while, just break down God's creation and just focus on something and then just really like dig into how vast, how awe-inspiring that creation is. I mean, like, think about an ant, okay? I mean, I'm just something. Pick an ant, okay? And you think about how strong an ant really is in comparison to us, you know, by, by weight and all those things. Then you think about that little tiny little ant also has to have some kind of a digestive tract and has to have some kind of, of way of living. And, and I mean, when you think about the intricacies of that ant and living and breathing and, and dying and all those things, it's like, that's just incredible. And that's just that little teeny little ant, Okay, I might have been inspired by watching a kid's show with ants yesterday in it. I don't know. But I was like, that's what it was. But think about the human body, man. Think about our, our bodies. I don't know if you realize this or not, but do you realize that every minute, every minute your bones are repairing? Did you know that? Your bones are tissues that get stronger over time, but then they break down and then they repair themselves and they keep getting stronger until every 10 years you have a new skeletal structure. Did you know that? Is that cool or what? I mean, some of us that are older might like debate that, but, you know. Did you know that your bodies produce 120 million blood cells made in the bone marrow? They carry oxygen to the body, but they also, they also uh, get rid of the carbon dioxide so you can live. That's incredible. Did you know that our body cleans its own blood. I mean, our, our kidneys, that's what they do. They're in there cleaning the blood, and, and they get rid of the blood, the bad blood. They, they re-send out the good blood to the body and all that kind of stuff, and they do it to the tunes of 1.2 liters every minute. Or our bodies, if you will, they go through the circulation process 30 times a day. Man, isn't God awesome? I mean, that's just a sampling. Looking at his human creation. See, there's more than what meets the eye. Believing in God is, simply more, or is more than just simply believing and, and looking at his creativity. You know, for Christmas, um, I, I received a Ruger 9mm pistol. And it came with instructions of how to use it. Here's the proper way to use it. And it also came with warning labels. If I didn't use it the way that they deemed was proper... I could expect harm and or death. 
what right does Ruger have to tell me what the proper use is of that gun? Well, Ruger's the manufacturer. They're the creators of that gun. They're the ones who have designed it to operate a certain way. And as the operators of that gun, as the ones who created it, they are the authority on what the proper use of it is. Now, if I decide that I'm not going to pay attention to that and I use it for a way that it's not intended to be used and I experience harm or death, then that's because of something I did, not because of something they did. It comes from me. Well, God as your creator is not just creative. As your creator, he is also your authority. He's the authority in how you should live your life. He has every right to determine how you should live your life. And that too comes with the manufacturer's warranty. Promising harm or death to you if you live as you should not live. To believe in God as your creator is to also acknowledge him as your authority. A true Christian believes in God as a creator and accepts him as their authority. That's just one thing. To believe in God also means that you have hope and confidence in him as the Savior. As Savior. We read in Isaiah 43, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt as a ransom for your freedom. I gave Ethiopia and Saba in your place. Others were given in exchange for you. I traded their lives for yours because you are precious to me. You are honored and I love you. Who's your Savior? Okay, let's just keep right on going, shall we? 1 John chapter 4, we've seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Who's the Savior? Oh, hey, we got a little bit of conflict here. Is God the Savior of the world or is Jesus the Savior of the world? Yeah, we're getting there. See, whenever you come across something like this in Scripture that seems to be an apparent contradiction, one of two things is true. Either Scripture is in error or you are. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we really believe, as it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we believe that all Scripture is inspired by God and therefore without error. So that I guess by, you know, deduction, it comes down to it has to be us, right? We have to be the ones in error. And when that's the case, we need to go back and study more until we can rectify that, that difference. We need to be able to figure out what that difference is. We've got to study more. And in this case, we get to answer this question by studying further. Is God the Savior of the world or is Jesus the Savior of the world? Here we go. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. It's kind of a strange wording already. He, being the Word, existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, the Word. And nothing was created except through Him, except through this Word. So who's the Word? Well, the Word became human and made His home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son, for the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. Still confused a little bit? Let's go back to creation, right at the very beginning again. God makes a very interesting statement as he's creating. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Let us... Make human beings in our image to be like us. I don't know if you ever saw that or not. Who is he talking to? Am I suggesting that Jesus was present at creation? Yes, I am. Even more so, I am saying that Scripture tells us that Jesus participated in creation. Well, hold on. How is that possible? Because Scripture says that God created all this stuff. Well, let's keep reading. All right, Colossians chapter 1. Christ 
is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Philip says when he's talking to Jesus, he said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? And in John chapter 10, clarifies, the Father and I are one. See, all of this is to say that Jesus and God are one and the same. Jesus was God in the flesh. That's what Scripture tells us. Therefore, Scripture is not contradicting itself when it attributes a character to one or the other because if you attribute the character to one, whether it be creator or savior, you're attributing it to the other one. To say this about God is to say this about Jesus. To say this about Jesus is to say this about God. They're one in the same. A true Christian believes that God and Jesus are one and the same, and therefore they are jointly the creator and jointly savior. But belief in God is not complete yet. We got to go a little further. To believe in God also means to have hope and confidence in him as Holy Spirit. We read in John chapter 4, God is spirit. So many people try to put some kind of image on God, you know, but we can't. God is spirit. Go right back to the creation again. Here's God. He's he's ready to create the heavens and the earth, right? And then we read in Genesis chapter 1 that the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. See, just as Jesus was present at creation because he is God, the Holy Spirit was present and participating in creation because he too is God. This is important, folks. This is incredibly important because in order for God to be infinite, he has to be spirit. In order for God to not be limited to the the dimensional restrictions of created things and to be able to be in all places at the same time, he needs to be spirit. It's critical that we believe this as Christians because our ability to live a life that honors God, to be holy, fully depends on Him as Spirit. We'll come back to that. So a true Christian must believe in God as Creator, as Savior, and as Holy Spirit. But that's just half of it. See, a true Christian also is one who professes belief in the teachings of Jesus Christ. That comes right out of Webster. You believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Another word for it is disciple. We've talked about that before. What's a disciple? A disciple is one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines of another. They are a follower of Jesus. That's where we get the word Christian, by the way. Very interesting. You read in Acts chapter 11, it says it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. You know why I like that? They were first called Christians. They were followers of Christ. Given to them by people who weren't necessarily followers of Christ. But the word Christ means anointed one. It's where we get Messiah. So the people who don't even believe he's the Messiah are labeling a group of people as Messiah followers. I don't know. I get a kick out of that. So a a believer, one who believes in God, not only believes in him as creator and his savior and his Holy Spirit, but they also believe in him as one who accepts the teachings of Jesus and assists in spreading the teaching of Jesus. Take a good look at that, because that's not an either or, that's a both and. They accept the teaching of Jesus and they assist in spreading the the teaching of Jesus. That's what the Bible means when they refer to a person as a Christian. Now that's a broad definition really considering all that Jesus teaches. I mean, he teaches a lot of stuff. 
but it's really narrow and it's really precise when it comes to the application of those various teachings. But we're still not ready to compile a complete list of what it means to be a Christian. I think it's important that before we do that, we go ahead and we define its counterpart, an atheist. An atheist is a person who disbelieves or who lacks belief in the existence of God or God's. This person doesn't really have any moral boundaries other than what they place upon themselves or what maybe the law might place upon them. As far as they are concerned, this life is all there is. There is nothing after this life. There's no eternity thing to worry about. You just live your life in this life the way you want to live your life. No problems. I'll do my thing. You do your thing. You're not wrong. I'm not wrong unless the law says we're wrong. So here's my question. A very thought-provoking question. Can a person be both a Christian and an atheist? Sort of. Sort of. We're going to coin a phrase today, or it's actually been coined by somebody else, a man named Craig Rochelle. He's a pastor, and he's an author. He refers to it as a Christian atheist. What's a Christian atheist? It's a person who believes in God, but lives as if he doesn't exist. This is a very critical piece. It's the final piece to our definition of Christian. It's not just believing in God as we've defined it. It's not just following the teachings of Jesus or or spreading the teaching of Jesus. But it's also living according to that teaching. A true Christian is a believer who follows what he or she has been taught or has been teaching others. In other words, they practice what they preach. See, the Bible already has a name for people who say one thing and live a different way, right? Who profess their belief in God but then live like he doesn't exist. And it's not a very flattering term every time you hear it. Matthew 23 The teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. They're the top dudes. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example, for they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands, and they never lift a finger to ease the burden. Everything they do is for show. See, the term Christian has been so grossly misused in our society that Christians want nothing to do with it. They, they abandon the term. They prefer things like follower of Jesus because it's a little more, you know, clarifying. That's a shame. But they do it because a lot of people who claim it live it like Pharisees. They tell everybody else how they should live and then they look down the noses at people how they're living and then they judge them and they condemn them. See, when you say a person is a Christian, biblically that means that they're a follower of the teachings of Scripture. Now, if you follow something, that means that something is the leader. So if you say that you're a follower of God, You're following Scripture. You're letting God take the lead, not you. See, either God leads you or you lead God. You can't do both at the same time. You can't be a follower and a leader at the same time. When a person is a true Christian, as described in Scripture, a follower of Jesus, they yield leadership of their life to him in every aspect. They stop taking the lead. When they refuse to do that or they just stop doing it all together, then they no longer can claim to be following Jesus. I'll just pick on something, okay, because it seems to be one that we all struggle with. You say, I just can't forgive that person. 
Okay, well, Scripture tells you that you need to forgive and that you'll be forgiven by the measure of which you forgive. Nope. I'm not doing it. You have no idea what that person's done to me. We just want to harbor the hate. Okay. But then don't utter that you're a, claim, that you're a follower of Jesus because at that moment you're not. In fact, at that moment, you're a Christian atheist. See how that works? And it's subtle, folks. It creeps in. It really does. It comes back and bites us all over the place. But we need to be aware of it. So that's the question is, how do we overcome it? How do we overcome it? Well, this is where the truth that, that God is spirit comes into play. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it's God who enables us to stand firm for Christ. He's commissioned us, and he's identified as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything that he's promised. See, as spirit, God is able to indwell our hearts all at the same time. As I'm standing up here talking to you, he's indwelling your heart too. And he's ministering to you and helping you grow and giving you knowledge and understanding at a different level than what he's giving me because we're all at different levels at different times. But that's how the Holy Spirit works. He gives us guidance. He gives us power to live as Christ followers, not as atheists. John chapter 16, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Paul says in Romans 8, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. See, true Christians are those who believe in God as Creator and Savior and as Holy Spirit, who live their lives according to His teachings to the best of their ability with the power of the Holy Spirit. Or as the writer of Hebrews said it, they sincerely seek Him. See, all of this we've been talking about is what it means to believe that God exists. This is what it means when we say that when the writer of Hebrews says you've got to believe He exists, you've got to believe He exists as Creator. You've got to believe He exists as Savior. You've got to believe that He exists as Holy Spirit. You've got to believe in the teachings of His Son, Jesus. You've got to follow the teachings of His Son, Jesus. You've got to teach the teachings of His Son, Jesus. All that's true. You've got to live according to those things. But you also got to you got to keep going after him and giving him the authority in your life. you got to continue to seek after him. Yield to him. Otherwise, it's being a Christian atheist. And a Christian atheist comes with its own warning label too. We read it in Romans chapter 8. Letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. The sinful nature is always hostile to God. Those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God, no matter how hard they try. See, Christian atheism does not and cannot please God. It just can't do it. So in order for us to be able to overcome it, we've got to be able to recognize it. So for the next few weeks, that's what we're going to do. We're going to take a look. We're going to expose the subtle ways in which atheism creeps into our Christian faith. Hopefully you'll find it eye-opening. More importantly, I hope you find it liberating. Let's pray together. Father, I just want to pray that for all of us, Lord, who claim to be followers of yours, that we'll take, we'll take a deeper look at that, that we will take stock of what we mean when we say we believe in you, that we will go deeper into that belief, that we will expand that belief, that we will check that belief according to Scripture, that we'll make sure, Father, that we acknowledge you as the authority in our life, that we recognize that your spirit indwells in us. That we 
subscribe to the teachings of Jesus and that we tell others the teaching of Jesus. And then, Lord, I would pray that in the next coming weeks, as we examine ways that, uh, as we call it, atheism creeps into our faith, Lord, I pray that you will encourage believers. Help us to be able to, to see it so that we can deal with it, so that we can continue to move on looking more like you, sounding more like you, acting more like you. Father, I pray at the end of this series, Lord, that we will have been changed and we will have been moved, that we will grow in you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Father everlasting, the all created one, God Almighty. And through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior.
the beginning. I'm going to ask you at the end, do you believe in God? And would you call yourself a Christian? Praise God, man. Go in peace. May the God of love and peace go with you now and forevermore. Amen. See you next week. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion. And in your home.